What we're really going to be talking about in this workshop are these seven Barcelona principles. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the Barcelona principles? That's more than your usual conference response, I should tell you, but it's delightful. So I'm not going to go into great depth, but basically, uh, two years ago at this very conference, the industry really, and, and the industry I'm referring to is really us, the, the PR measurement industry, if it's such, or community, you know, adopted seven pretty simple, straightforward statements about sort of what's right and what's wrong, and how do you proceed with communications measurement. Um, and behind these seven statements that you're seeing right here, there was a lot more to it. There's a, sort of a page on each one, but these are sort of the basic tenets of them. And so what we're really going to do here in this workshop is with the help of my three colleagues, uh, is, is walk you through, so if, if these are sort of the principles, well, how do you actually apply them? Uh, how do you uh, use them within a company? What are good examples? What are tough examples? What things are kind of hard to overcome? And so that's really our purpose here this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about goal setting, number one, and, and transparency, the last one. Um, Andre is going to talk next about uh, media measurement and what's good and bad and ugly and great. Uh, so he's really going to cover principles four and five. And Andre is the vice president uh, for corporate communications at Philips. He's based in Amsterdam. Um, and you also look over pretty much all communications pretty much around the world for that uh, company. Uh, then we're going to have Cindy Connor. Cindy Connor is the Director of Citizenship and Reputation Management for FedEx, based in Memphis, Tennessee. You may catch a little bit of a southern accent from time to time. I believe she's from Mississippi, which we'll bring out shortly, uh, a little bit later. And she's going to cover off principles two and, and three. And then really the one that's sort of the toughest to break into and really understand is number six in the sense of, and you see it in the, in, frankly in this conference program about how much time we're gonna talk about social media measurement, how do you do it, and uh, what are the right standards and approaches. And so David Kellis from Clorox, based in San Francisco, he's the director of social media and public relations there, will really talk about that and, and what they're doing at Clorox. So my job is really to spend just a couple minutes with you and, and talk about um, this idea of goal setting, and how do you do it? And one of the things that, that's sort of relevant here that, that came out of, frankly, Barcelona was the setting up of sort of a hierarchy. And the hierarchy kind of works like it's shown on this slide. The stuff called outputs, which are uh, parts of uh, principles four and five, and Andre's gonna talk to them, is really around measuring media results. It's measuring traditional media, it's measuring social media, but it's all around, let's measure if we do a, a communications activity, how much stuff shows up in the press and, and again, defining the press very loosely. And that's very good to know, but the, really the next question is like, so what? So you got a lot of coverage. Did it really do anything? Did anybody change? Did their awareness of something, their knowledge, their perception, their behavior toward it change? And that's that bucket called outcomes. And then really at the end of the results, so people like your company more. Let's say you got a lot of press, press coverage and the reputation went up. People really like your company more. At the end of the day, did it do anything for your business? And so the Barcelona principles and basically set up this hierarchy. And similarly, goal setting is set up around this hierarchy as well. It's basically around the idea that what we do in communications is, is we reach people, right? We get to them and we deliver a message. And then the question is, did that change what people have heard of, what they're aware of? Do they, what they understand, uh, what they believe or feel, or their attitude or perception, and ultimately how they behave. And so goal setting, again, principle one, how do you do it? You basically write goals around these metrics that are shown right here on this slide. And to help with that, I believe there's a workshop earlier today my friend Mike Daniels put on, and it was he showed you something called the valid metrics because one of the things that came out of Barcelona is you know the big news so to speak was you know AVEs are bad. Everybody got that message AVEs are bad. Nobody's ever heard this before. <laughs> Pauline, have you ever heard this? Once. Okay. Christina, you? Yeah. Trace. Good. Okay. So AVEs are bad. So then the question is, well, so what's good? And the trouble with answer with the question is what's good is it depends on what you were trying to do. What's good for an employee communications program 
is way different than, let's say, what's good for trying to get people to buy and hold a company stock or buy a car. And so one of the things that we did through Amic was to create these matrices. And if you're, you know, if you're measuring PR, they're a great resource to go to to say, OK, if AVEs are out, let me look at what I should be focused on and what are the metrics to set goals around um, moving forward. And so this one here is for brand marketing. There are other ones for, again, all the different forms of communications. But they're really intended to the answer to the question, if AVEs are out, then what do we focus on when we write goals? Because the first thing that really the Barcelona principle said was, you know what? Before you go out and measure, figure out what you're trying to do. In other words, write goals around what you are trying to achieve, and then you measure them. A lot of times in communications, what we do is we run a program, we then go measure it, and then somebody says, well, is this good or bad? And you go, I don't know. We never wrote goals. We just, it must be good because there was a lot of something. And so what happened in Barcelona, and really what this is intended to imply, is the first step before you talk about what replaces AVEs, or how do you measure social media, or how do you do market mix modeling to demonstrate ROI, it's all around first stating what you were trying to achieve. And so my little brief part here is just to focus on, so how exactly do you write goals? What's a good goal and what's a bad goal? And basically when you write goals, you kind of start with this. You kind of go, why am I doing this PR program or this communications program? What is the business benefit of that? The reality is if you can't answer why you're doing a communications program in terms of how it relates to the organization or business you're doing it for, I wouldn't bother doing the rest. There's something markedly wrong. If you don't know what, how what you're doing benefits the business, forget about it. And so basically when you write goals, you first sort of answer the question, what am I trying to achieve within my organization? For Antonia, for example, at UNICEF, am I trying to drive donations, for example, to UNICEF? And I will use more earned media to get press placements to help raise awareness and interest in what UNICEF does, would be an example. But once you've made that sort of business connection, the next thing you do is you write communications goals around really, let me just back up, these five areas. And it's basically the idea of saying, okay, how much of this is targeted toward awareness, as in I want people to have heard of something, understand something, which is comprehension, perception, or ultimately, to use Antonia's example, if you don't mind, Antonia, um, you all right with that? Um, you know, driving donations specifically. And when you write a goal, and the only way you can write a measurable goal, as far as I know, is you have to sort of basically identify four things. Who is it you're trying to affect? What about them is going to be different at the end? How much is good? And, all, and then, by when are you going to have done this? If you don't answer those four questions, the rest of this measurement stuff kind of falls by the wayside, because it doesn't then matter really what you measure, or frankly, what you observe. So I want to show you some examples of goals. And I'll, I'll fess up. These were written by people in my own company, some of our best and brightest people. And if you look at them, you, let me ask you something. I just told you what should be in a goal. It should be who, what, how much, by when. Any observations about these goals, Chris? Just to call on you and make you wonder, why did I come to this session? <laughs> you think they are measurable, OK? Ben? Yeah, these goals, the ones that are on the screen right in front of you, those goals. <laughs> oh, these goals. Yes, I'm sorry, I was confusing. So to Ben's point, if you don't mind, Ben, I'm going to, oh, good, you got the mic, go ahead. I said they're missing the how much and by when. Yeah, these are great examples of communications goals. They basically have no numbers in them, okay? They don't have dates. So you don't know when whatever this is going to happen is going to occur. And frankly, they don't have how much. They don't indicate what, how much is a change that you are trying to measure. So if you don't get this part right, it's real hard to get the rest of the stuff right that Andre and Cindy and David are going to talk about. But the thing that to me is most difficult about these particular goals is that they include things that no one else in the world would really say. Okay. For example, if you look at the first one, we're going to build consumer buzz. Well, what exactly is consumer buzz, and how would you know it if you saw it, right? What is it? Is it like, um, I don't know, what is it? Is it buzz sound like honeybees make? 
Um, or even let's take the last one. It's one of my favorite ones. This is um, for a vodka company. We're going to set an emotional connection with consumers. So if my goal was to set an emotional connection with consumers, what I, at relative to this vodka, I'd take Christina out tonight. I would feed Christina a tremendous amount of this vodka, and I will guarantee you, by the end of the evening, she will be expressing some emotion. It may be remembering a date that went wrong, a date that went right, I don't know, some emotion. She'll be crying or laughing, but I'll guarantee you one of those things is, I mean, not you particularly Christina, but that is an example of an emotional connection which theoretically would fulfill his goal. Or, David, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to pick on your company. It isn't related to your company, but it's, it's somebody who did a draft a long time ago. Not at Ketchum, David. Um, shape the bleach dialogue online. Okay? You wrote that. That's a great goal, and uh, we look forward to continuing working with Clorox um, <laughs> for a very long time. Or the bank card. Well, let's, I'll pick on that first. So if I wanted to shape the bleach dialogue online, here's what I'd do. So all I got to do is I gotta, just got to shape that dialogue. So I'm going to start blog posting that um, I really don't like my mother-in-law, and the best way to kill her is to start getting her to drink little bits of Clorox bleach with every morning's glass of orange juice, and that will kill her. If I started posting that, that would shape the bleach dialogue online. Maybe not in the way that Clorox particularly thought would be a good idea, but nonetheless it would do it. And the point is what we're very guilty of in public relations in particular, and communications more broadly, is we don't set goals up front, and we don't set them in a way that's measurable. And measurable, again, is around those four things of the who's going to change, how much is going to be different, by when, and what is it that's going to change about them. It's not going to be buzz. It's not going to be making an emotional connection. It's not going to build better relationships with stakeholders. It's about real things, and those real things are what you measure. So I just want to do a couple slides. So that's basically um, principle number one. I'm going to cover off again principles one and seven and then turn it over to my colleagues. Principle seven was all around transparency and re replicability, as in if you do something once, you should be able to do it a second time. And, and it sounds sort of like a throwaway idea. Okay, yeah, we should be transparent, we should be open, we should be honest, we should have integrity, we should be ethical. Those all sound good, but what was the real intention here? The real intention was to get at the idea that a lot of times in what we do, even in measurement, is we create these numbers or metrics which no one else understands. And so, for example, I personally see a lot of companies that are trying to sell me something, okay? Trying to sell me measurement services. And they'll come in and they'll say, hey, we want you to buy the special gizmo we make to measure social media. And the end result is going to be, and just because you're, you're possibly going to be a great customer as ours, we've run this for you. And we've created the Net Sentiment Mutual Love Index. That's our special thing. And your number is 57. I go, wow, that's great. How do you get this mutual net, whatever it's called, index? We can't share that with you. Well, is 57 good or bad? Really can't tell you that either, because that's our proprietary formula. But the reality is, let me ask you, they would tell me, you know, what kind of car do you drive? Well, I drive a truck. Do you care how the motor of that truck really works? Right? I don't really care. On the other hand, I'm not being evaluated by how well my truck motor works, but I am being evaluated by whatever I buy here. So the point is, when it comes to the idea of transparency, and this is what this slide is intended to say, is you need to be able to identify, this is basically showing you where points are assigned in a particular scoring system. And so the idea of transparency that we agreed on two years ago was to say, you know what, that whole idea of the net mutual index love, whatever the hell I just called it, thing, is not a good idea. What we as an industry want to focus on are things people understand and numbers that are in fact truly relevant and meaningful. So in this case, yeah, we kind of do want to know how the engine in the truck or the engine in the car actually works. The second part of transparency that we were trying to get at when we wrote this two years ago was transparencies in surveys. So if you commission a survey, here's what you're entitled to know. You're entitled to know, among other things, how did they write the questionnaire? 
You see, with a questionnaire, you can create all kinds of biases. If I ask you a series of questions, for example, about have you heard of any of the following instances where some nutcase went and killed people, and then I follow that sequence with a question of do you support greater gun control, the likelihood of you answering yes is way up because I went ahead and first asked you a whole bunch of things, right? Or if I use words like, so what do you think of bureaucrats? Bureaucrats is a bad word. What do you think of government officials? Very different response. So the point of understanding a questionnaire is really understanding those nuances. And then frankly, the point around transparency when it comes to surveys is also understanding who exactly got surveyed and what was done with the data. And those were the ideas we were trying to get behind. For example, when it comes to who was surveyed, did you equally survey men and women? Did you screen, let's say, for a certain age group? And or was it done online or done by telephone, and if so, how? If it's done by telephone, right now, if you want to reach a representative sample of Americans in the United States, there's about, you have to have about 40% of your sample be to cell phone only households, because not all households have landlines anymore. Some of those nuances are the sort of ideas behind transparency. Similarly, weighting, which is identified in this chart, it's a big deal. A lot of times you run a survey, right? You just do a survey of 1,000 people. You don't actually get a representative sample of the public. You have to weight the data back. Sometimes that weighting gets very, very complicated, and it's a very important thing to convey. So this whole area of surveys, and actually the media measurement slide before, is the stuff of entire conferences on the subject. But I really wanted to just lay out for you as it related to principles one, goal setting, and principle seven, transparency and rec replicability, which we should have chosen a better word, I think, in hindsight, but we're done. So I just wanted to lay out for you what those are, and I'm gonna now turn this over to my colleague, oh, Andre Manning. Andre, as I mentioned, is the Vice President for Corporate Communications for Royal Phillips Electronics, and really oversees much more than just the electronics business, but really the all the places you are in healthcare and in lighting and many, many different places in 42 countries, I believe, around the world. And so, Andre, let me turn it over to you and yeah. let you take over. Thank you, Davis. This is not a second time they put you, put me in between they you had and the mic the right height a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the woman after me has to adjust it again. Okay. No, um, thank you, David. I will. Uh, I will spend some time on a couple of elements of the uh, Barcelona principles and uh, what we have done with it uh, in Philips. We're in uh, close to 100 companies instead of 42 countries. Um, we, we measure. Sorry? We measure. We measure 42 countries. Um, why measurement in Philips? And this is a client perspective. So if you uh, team up with clients in the market, uh, I always say for my function, there's a couple of elements. Uh, measurements provides me an added value as a function. It provides me the link between myself as a function and the business, because they want to see, uh, I need to speak the language of my business partners. I have to provide them with KPIs, I have to provide them with improvement plans, and I have to provide them with outcome-related programs. Um, it's all about accountability. Uh, I think we as communications professionals have too long in a kind of luxurious position, luxurious situation, where the accountability was not really there. Uh, people could, uh, could come up with some, uh, some nice media coverage. That's what it is. That's, that's what was, uh, was, was mainly the KPI. Uh, those times are over. I think measurement builds on your professionalism. I think the 21st century communications director, at least in a company like Philips, but I think in many other companies, should be a professional that also speaks the language of KPIs. And it reflects, uh, I think, the ongoing uh, developments within the communications world, uh, which uh, has to do with uh, a dialogue-driven uh, ecosystem versus a monologue, a uh, broadcast-based uh, communications platform. Uh, it is also, I think, uh, it touches upon the shift that is going on currently uh, where a lot of money 
at least in our company, but I th also think in other companies, money is spent from the traditional, or is shifted from the traditional marketing communications channels, like advertising, towards the PR channels, and that's an enormous opportunity. Um, just a little bit, um, what have we done in the past, present, and future? I think everybody in this room still remembers the clipping books. They were messy, they were cumbersome, uh, they took a lot of time, they ended up in drawers. Uh, communication people were very happy with it, but no one else looked at it. Uh, where are we now, 2012? And I will give you an example of that. We have the online portals. They are user-friendly. Ours is available 24, 7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in all the markets that we operate. And where are we going to? To, a, in, to an even more in-depth analytics program where the return on investment for our function is even more there. And, if possible, linked to the actual sales of your company. David and I have regular discussions on it because he is much more advanced that we can uh, link it to the actual sales of the company. I'm a little bit hesitant there, uh, but okay, that's an ongoing uh, discussion. Um, I think, David, you showed it already, the seven principles of Barcelona. Uh, I think we were one of the first uh, companies to, uh, to endorse them, to embrace them, um, and indeed to be very vocal on the fact that AVEs are not the value of public relations. I think uh, uh, we agreed on that, that every time that you off invite me to come to speak, that I should at least say that AVEs should be dismissed. Okay. So I uh, kept up to my promise. Now, I, I, I firmly believe in it, that if you are in communications, AVEs, and I also keep that to my own organizations, and we get the question at least twice or three times a year since we installed our program, can we shift back to AVEs? I said, no, there's no way back. AVEs is a completely different thing. Don't measure your media coverage in terms of advertising value, unless anybody disagrees. We're all in agreement. We have achieved something in the last two years. Um, what are we doing now? We set goals before we measure. As you already mentioned, we set goals. Uh, before we launch the programs. And I will also give you some uh, insights on how we measure, or how we set a goal that has to do with behavior and attitude. Because I think that was the number four or five on your list. Uh, it's not only about the impressions or media coverage, no, it's about the actual attitude and behavior. And I'll give you some insights on what we have done in Philips also to align that to the marketing function and to the business function. Um, impressions and clips are meaningless uh, numbers. Uh, and everything we do is transparent. I use one system across the company. Every market has access to that. We have 150 communications professionals in our company. And all communications professionals, if you're located in Japan, the US, the headquarters in the Netherlands, our lighting sector in the Netherlands, uh, healthcare in the US, uh, Mexico, Brazil, whatever market, you have the same kind of system, you have access to the same kind of data, and your results, if you're in Mexico, are visible to your colleagues, to the rest of the world, and the, vis and the results of the colleagues of the rest of, of the world are also visible to you. On a 24 uh, hours a day base, which we built a little bit of a Ferrari for an organization that is used to drive a Volvo. So we did a little bit too much uh, bells and whistles. But I think one of the, the key uh, elements of success is that we have a monthly scorecard, a monthly dashboard available for all my communications people around the world. Um, where are we? We designed this program, I think, this, uh, two years ago three years ago, and we installed it, uh, I think, in the beginning of 2010 for the first time, Q1 2010. Um, in the meantime, it has been an in, uh, important element of the success of the function. Um, there was no system in place uh, when I came back from the US to lead the function in, uh, from the headquarters. Um, we had scattered uh, media measurement systems and media monitoring systems around the world. Uh, the most difficult discussion we had with the people in the markets 
because I have to have discussions with people in Germany, France, or the UK who were used to monitor everything. And we made a bold decision, and we stick still to that decision that there's only 550 media for our, our company around the world that really matter. So 250 key media from all the markets, 300 uh, online media, of uh, uh, trade media, and now we have identified an additional between 50 and 60 influential bloggers. So can you imagine a market like Germany that tracked 600 media previous to the uh, introduction of this system had to go back from 600 media to only 10 media? That was a tough discussion. What we did, um, as I said already, we linked it to one of our business KPIs and one of the KPIs even of our executive committee, which is called NPS. Anybody knows what NPS is? Net score. Correct, net, net promoter score. Do you also, can you also explain what it is or only where it stands for? If you ask somebody whether they would recommend your service. If you ask somebody whether the person will recommend your service uh, to somebody else, yeah. And yeah. you measure that. Yeah, you measure that and you give the score. So basically it's one question. Would you recommend this company, this service or this product to someone else? And you can score between a zero and a ten. Um, and, I'll, uh, and, and I'll show you later how we did it in, uh, in uh, media measurement. Um, and you have three qualifications. So they use this in marketing within our company, and I see it now being implemented in more companies. If you score between a zero and a four, you're seen as a detractor, as a detractor for the company. So if, uh, uh, if the question is asking, score below four, it's a detractor. If you score between a four and an eight out of a scale of 10, you're seen as neutral. And there comes the problem, only a nine and a 10 within the NPS terminology, within the NPS metrics, are seen as a promoters for your company, for your reputation, for your brand, or your products. So I installed this within a media measurement system. And of course, I got a lot of pushback from uh, my colleagues in the market, because they said, how can you ever measure uh, media, me uh, media coverage in NPS terminology where journalists have to be neutral? They can never be promoters. Fair question, but I think that's the same. The same question is valid for a customer. A customer, in essence, is neutral. If you go to a shop and you want to buy new lighting LED light bulbs, you're completely neutral. You can buy Philips. You can buy some from the competition who, that I won't mention. But we hope that we have done some work that you buy a Philips LED light bulb. I think that's the same for an article in the FT. An FT reporter, in essence, is neutral. It's my job, it's, my jo it's the job of my colleagues in the market to make him or her, from that certain uh, publication, a promoter for a Philips story, a Philips uh, uh, strategy. I told you, we have one transparent measurement system. We have an online dashboard 24 hours a day available. You have your password when you're in the market, you click on it and you have access to it. Um, the online dashboard, uh, the summarized version, will, uh, get, uh, will be distributed amongst my colleagues uh, with the scores every month and we get a quarterly uh, scorecard. And at the beginning of the year, for the whole Philips organization, the communications organization, will set the KPIs. And indeed, we'll set the score of an 8 as a KPI for NPS. And then we live, deliver these kind of uh, measurement system report scorecards on a monthly basis, where we score indeed total volume of uh, analyzed coverage. I think that was the first one you showed in your uh, list of bullet points. And you see uh, in the middle net promoter score. And then you see uh, also reflected who is responsible for the actual uh, KPIs. In our uh, world, we have three sectors, healthcare, lighting, and uh, consumer lifestyle. And we have corporates, uh, the, the things we do in, uh, in Amsterdam on a financial level. Um, and then we make it available per market. So you see exactly 
Uh, this is about Q4 2011 versus Q3 2011, that Japan had the highest NPS score, followed by Middle East, followed by Poland, APEC, and that Brazil, in this case, together with the Nordics, Italy, were below a seven. And I think the majority was below a seven. In the end, we had a 7.7 .7 score, which is very tough because it looks great and Japan looked great, etc. but the overall aggregate score of our media measurement system in this case was a 7.7, .7, so it didn't do anything for our brand. If you put it very black and white in the NPS terminology, all the efforts did not lead to the fact that these kind of, on the market level they were, but overall not seen as promoters uh, for the Philips story or the Philips brand. We have some opportunities. I think we are using the, uh, the, 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 the system now two years. Uh, we also made a mistake in the beginning uh, because we rolled it out via the communications X. Uh, what we should have done is include the business partners in the markets uh, much more upfront to already establish the link between communications and, uh, and, uh, and the business in a very early stage. Um, but we, I think we're quite in the, uh, in the front uh, league, uh, or in the, if you talk uh, about uh, a football analogy, we're in the Premier League of, uh, of measurement, I think. Um, but we still have to move it to the next level. We have some challenges, um, because brand equity is still also comprised of intangible parts that cannot be measured. Um, we have the indirect association between PR and sales. Is there? And, uh, is there an association? Uh, I worked between 2005 and 2009 in the US, and we did some tests with actually communications programs, PR programs, and sales increase in specific markets uh, for specific product launches, so that worked. For the overall reputation of the company is, of course, much, difficult, much more difficult. Um, I think we're all overwhelmed by uh, different kind of metrics. Uh, I think we have to make a selection. You already made uh, the statement there. We should all use the same kind of metrics. Um, and of course, uh, when you're in a company like ours, but I think that it's valid for every, uh, every company, uh, there's financial indicators and there's the non-financial indicators. And the non-financial indicators become more, pro more dominant, I think, in the future. Is it employee retention, which is basically an internal communications tool, but you can also use it for external comms? Is it the number of influencing influencers advocating your uh, message? I think the presentation will be available online, eh? uh, Barry, so I don't go through every bullet point here. Uh, that's not good use of my time. Um, one of the other challenges is that uh, we have a couple of uh, researches going on in the organization. We have a marketing intelligence uh, group uh, who does a lot of research related to marketing or related to sales. Uh, we have our employee engagement study every, uh, every year. Uh, we have our uh, media measurement. We have our NPS scores. We have a brand equity uh, heartbeat studies. So we have a lot of research going on in how to link the outcomes of the different parts of research in the organization. When you're a company of the size of ours, it's not always easy to link all these kind of resources and research uh, that is available within the company. My light is blinking to orange, which is good, because the Dutch soccer squad plays in orange tonight. <laughs> Uh, but they play Germany, so for those Germans in the room, I won't make any bet. I have to, uh, I have to round off. Heartbeat uh, on a country and business level, we have we have net promoter score surveys, all this kind of information. How to incorporate that in one overall system that is relevant for the company? We are not there yet. I, th I think it will take us one or two more years to link them all together and to provide all the main stakeholders in the company, the business sector head leads, uh, the management uh, teams in the market, with one overall approach where you provide insights on measurement towards a different target audience. Because media measurement is one thing. Of course, we have the overall reputation surveys. We have the employee engagement. So they should have one dashboard where all of these things come together and where all the actions 
because that's one of the most important things. You can measure a lot, but what are you doing with all the measurement where all the actions are also will be, will be aligned uh, together. Summary. Uh, Barcelona principles were for us very helpful. We used it as a sort of a accelerator to implement our own uh, measurement system in the organization. We have an excellent outputs and outcomes related measurement system. NPS, uh, linked to NPS, which is important for our culture. So I would challenge everybody that if you work with clients uh, and that have certain metrics in the organization, link your uh, measurement to those uh, measurement metrics that are already available uh, in, the, in, a, in, in the company. And we have to much better integrate our results and our outcomes and our system with all the other systems that we have in the company. I think within 18 minutes, <laughs> 10 seconds. We have tried a story. Great. I think we have to save the questions for yep. the end. Yep. Andre, thank you. <laughs> all right, so let me get the microphone back to a level that uh, Cindy and I can use more, anyway, effectively. You know, if you walk around the halls of the Breitner Center, which is the headquarters at Philips in Amsterdam, the language there is, as Andre pointed out, net promoter score. And so you see his media measurement system set up in, with that in mind. If you walk the halls, however, of FedEx's headquarters in Memphis, what you hear a lot is reputation and its measurement, which is really more of an outcome measurement. So to talk about outcome measurement, let me turn this over to uh, our friend and colleague, Cindy Connor. Again, she's the Director of Citizenship and Reputation Management at FedEx. And I believe we have an intro song for Cindy. Or we did. Would you like me to sing a few bars? No, I, I, it was an idea. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Uh, we'll talk about it later at the bar tonight. All right. Um, I don't, how many of y'all were in um, Lisbon? Anybody in Lisbon? Okay, uh, good. Well, I think there are a couple of reasons that David invites me every year. Am I? You can hear me without this anyway. Uh, one is my accent, which I honestly, I don't know what he's talking about. Um, but if I go too fast or you can't understand me, sort of raise your hand and I'll try to slow down. Contrary to the popular myth, Southern American Southerners do not always speak slowly. So I get excited and I'm excited about what I do, so sometimes I'll talk really fast. The other thing was my close relationship to Elvis Presley. Um, Elvis is from Memphis, or well, actually near Memphis, and last year I said at the conference that if you invited me back to the meeting next year, because I knew it was going to be in Dublin, that I would talk about Elvis. Um, that's going to be a little bit difficult because I realize this is a business meeting and you're here for important business information. So what I tried to do was to do a little research and a little measurement and come up with some connections between Elvis and FedEx since I'm here to talk with you about FedEx. So I've got some questions for you, and I have some prizes, and Tracy, I may need your help with this. Uh, just as an example of how the two can be brought together, and you can sort of use Elvis to measure FedEx and vice versa. Uh, Fred Smith is the founder of FedEx, and although we often think of uh, you know companies or just people too, it's kind of a stretch to get that Elvis FedEx connection, so sometimes I use Fred Smith. Uh, Fred Smith was an only child. Elvis had a twin brother who died at birth, so Elvis was an only child. So, see, they're practically like this. Uh, Elvis was born in Tupelo, Mississippi. Fred Smith was born in Marks, Mississippi. Okay? So you're kind of getting the, the, the flavor of this. Here's, here's one. And if I wander around, can you, can you still hear me? Okay, this microphone's kind of driving me crazy. Um, FedEx has almost 100,000 trucks. Anybody know how this connects to, um, to Elvis? And wait, wait, don't go too fast. I have to show you. The prize is this lovely keychain, which is also a bottle opener, which might work for tonight at the bar when I sing the song for you. So anybody know the connection between FedEx trucks and Elvis? Is Booster Bucks here the No. Truck, FedEx has trucks. What might Elvis have done in his youth? Truck driver. Who said truck driver? Okay. Tracy, I need to. Come on, you're going to have to get up. I'm trying to wake y'all up after lunch. 
Do you know? Okay, got to uh, keep moving because my clock is moving. Uh, FedEx has more than 600 airplanes. You have an airplane? Yes, we have a winner. <laughs> <laughs> See, right. y'all are catching on. Lovely Elvis luggage tag. Damn. Okay, work with me. Uh, here's uh, um, our founder, Fred Smith. FedEx founder served in the United States Marines. Elvis. No, Elvis was not a Marine. Okay, uh, who said Army? Okay, here we have a Elvis replica driver's license. Do not use this to try to get through security at the airport. Okay, um, and I'm out of prizes, but the last one, just for in, which I thought was kind of interesting, was you know Elvis made 33 movies. Actually, it was I think it's uh, 31 movies and two documentaries. What do you know about FedEx and movies? Castaway. Well, she's a double winner, so we, it's a good thing we don't have anything else for her. Uh, you know, really. Sarah, some. Don't, don't you live in Dubai? How do you know all this Elvis stuff? Oh, okay. uh, there's apparently not much to do in Dubai except watch Elvis movies. I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Call me crazy. Um, but on to more important things, which is, is why we're here. It was interesting to me this morning to sit in, in the sessions because, as Andre mentioned, uh, the three of us are clients. So for me, listening to your speakers is sort of like looking behind the curtain. You know, I'm seeing the things you're talking about before you come to me with your great proposals and your great estimates for your great proposals. And it really helps me to think sort of like you do to help understand what you're bringing to my company to help support us. You know, at the same time, I hope what you get from this session today is, is a little more of what the client is thinking and maybe what your clients are not telling you they're thinking uh, that will help you the next time you're meeting with them to try and offer them with some great solutions. Basically, FedEx, as, um, let's see where are we? as uh, David mentioned, we really focus a lot on reputation management. We're in the business of trying to help people understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And we feel like this helps to, to lead to the great reputation that we have today. We look at, let's see, okay. We have a lot of title slides here. Okay. We look at reputation and brand as separate but, but very much related disciplines. In other words, your brand is something that you can purchase. You can, you can buy brand awareness. Um, but reputation really is something you earned. We talk a lot about earned, paid, and owned media, and we think sort of on the reputation side of the house, what we're able to do with earned and owned is, is really gaining in credibility and in influence on the outcomes of the company and how successful or not successful we are. You know, we talked brand for years. Everything was brand, and so everybody kind of got on the brand bandwagon. So now we've really moved into reputation, and I think reputation is becoming much more accepted as a way of looking at companies. Um, the head of our uh, communications area, Bill Margaritas at FedEx, has really been looking at reputation management, I think, for close to 20 years. He's been a real pioneer, but reputation is now being pretty much accepted. So where we're actually moving from there is more into what's the character of the corporation. And it's, a, I believe it was an Abraham Lincoln quote, but don't hold me to this. But he, I believe, famously said, or someone famously, famously said, character is like a tree and reputation is the shadow. So we've gone from kind of brand, which is kind of out there, that we're able to purchase. So it's not quite as, as legitimate, I don't think, as, as something you earn. Don't quote me for saying brand is not legitimate. It is, but it doesn't have quite the same impact. To the reputation, which is the shadow of that tree. Yes, yeah, stop that tweeting. To the tree, which is actually that's your corporate character, and that's what you really are and who you are, and particularly in the day of, of this amazing um, ability we have to communicate instantly and individually, that, that character, that tree that you've got, becomes increasingly important for the outcome of your company, which is kind of what we're, we're all about. Again, I, when I talked about reputation, we have studied reputation to death. Y'all have measured it to death. We have researched it to death. And I think pretty much people agree reputation is important. It makes a difference. 
people buy companies from companies with a good reputation. They want to work for them. They want those companies in their communities, which is important to us. We have close to 300,000 team members around the world. We have all those trucks and planes, like you know Elvis liked. Um, and so we really want to. We want you to want us in your community. We want to give value to our shareholders. We want to be a company people want to work for. So this is very important to us. Of course, the trick, and this is where y'all all come in, is this is what we want. We all have things we want in life. The big question is how do we get them? And through research and measurement is how we get to where we want to be. This is a look at our reputation. We think we're pretty darn good. We've. Um, we're on a lot of lists. We're on a lot of third-party lists. We do a lot of proprietary information research that gives us a little more specifically about how we're doing and what we're doing. So we feel like we're in a good place. But as you all know, being in a good place and staying in a good place is not exactly the same thing. We talk about this a lot is the pedestal effect. You know, when you're up here, it's great, but there's only one way to go, and that's down. So we have to keep working at what is, we know what that reputation, what got us that reputation yesterday, and maybe what got it today, but what we really need to know is what's going to get it for us tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and we're going to be held in that same high regard because it changes. You know that. There's nothing that stays the same um, in the world. And that's one of the things I really love about communications, because what it was when I started is very different than it is now. How we measured it, uh, those AVE things that are now so evil. You know, once that was the latest, greatest, everybody was excited. It was, woo we've discovered something fabulous. So it's changing, it's going to change, and we've got to stay ahead of that change. We talk a lot also about how we illustrate our reputation and how we illustrate our success and how we got, get those people to want to do business with us and want to, uh, to be uh, you know, net promoters and not detractors or negatives. And we'll talk a little more about our kind of that middle ground for us later. But another thing that's really big these days is storytelling. My, my contention, I think storytelling started with cavemen. I don't think this is anything new, but it is very powerful. And when we can take the numbers that you all give us in this room to direct what we're doing and to set those goals, and then we can talk about ourselves in terms of stories, that's when we really create a powerful image, and that's when we, I think we really start making a difference in those outcomes. It's combining those numbers and those great stories. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a story, and when you start falling asleep, we'll, we'll cut it off. But uh, this is an example of a project that we did recently that I think you'll find interesting if you're not already familiar with it. Sunshine and Suisi arrived by Panda FedEx Express from China yesterday. Edinburgh Zoo is paying £7 million to keep them for the next 10 years, during which time it's hoped they will breed. Every penny and more is expected to be made back by the number of visitors the pair will attract. What's important? Well, obviously the most important thing is the safety and security of the animals, the attendants, our crew and, and, and our asset, the, the airplane that we're flying. And finally tonight, more big news from the UK, a FedEx special delivery that has the Brits in a frenzy. They were greeted by bagpipes, costumes and kilts after an eight-hour journey from China with in-flight no meals on a plane specially chartered and adapted dubbed the Panda Express. You know, we have fed and, and monitored the pandas throughout the entire uh, trip. Between eating the panda cakes and the carrots and the apples, they were just as happy as they could be. Over to Scotland, what was the big news of the week? The economy, global warming? Nope. It was all about these guys.
Two giant pandas. Giant pandas. Giant pandas. Giant pandas. Giant pandas. Giant pandas have arrived in Scotland from China. Sunshine and Sweetie were unloaded from their private plane after a 5,000 mile journey. Un peu insolite, je vous propose d'écouter le directeur de FedEx rencontré tout à l'heure avec Sébastien Savoie. C'est la cinquième fois que nous transportons des pandas. Yuanzi et Wan Wan sont arrivés en France. Les deux pandas prêtés par la Chine, okay. attendus très officiellement à Roissy. Vous le voyez sur ces. Come later if you want the rest of the panda story. Um, but I think that shows you, that was very emotionally, um, that was great. That was kind of taking the person out to for the drink of vodka, I think, after work. Uh, we had a lot of numbers there, but the, the, the next step is, you know, did this make a difference in the way people felt about us, the way we regarded, they regarded FedEx? Uh, one of the things that we are really looking at measurement of is trust. Our chairman, Fred Smith, you know, Elvis's best friend, said recently that what, we're, what FedEx is really selling is trust, and that's what a lot of people are looking for in companies. And what we were selling with these pandas was, you, you know, people trust us to get these very important animals there. So we feel like it was effective. Again, uh, we have numbers to go with it, but we want to be able to tell that story even more compellingly. So the main gap that we've seen is sort of where the rubber meets the road is do we, have we, what is the, the moving beyond results, the media coverage, the outputs like we talked that were shown here on the pandas, to what those have generated? Or is it generating a change in behavior? Behavior or people a positive change in behavior? Um, to uh, what David was talking about earlier, we don't want just a change. We want a change where they like us. Um, So how do, we, how do we do that? How do we make that happen? How do we decide on the front end exactly what that thing we want to make happen is? And then how do we measure it after the fact? We've t I've talked about a lot of things I feel like we know uh, about. We know about brand. We know about reputation. We're work getting into this sort of character uh, idea now. But the other thing we have to keep doing is challenging our assumptions. Some of the research that we did several years ago seemed to indicate that there was a problem with FedEx, uh, not so much uh, the you know, net people, but sort of the un unknown people that were not our promoters, they were just didn't really know, in the, the middle of the United States. We call this the heartland, which is basically what you fly over. You fly over, we fly over between New York and Los Angeles. It's all that kind of stuff in the middle. So we really started working really, really hard on focusing our efforts on those communities, reaching out to those people. But then we came back and Ketchum did some more work for us and we discovered it wasn't really that heartland in the middle. It was just those kind of average people, the average Joes, whether they be in Los Angeles, New York, or um, somewhere in the wilds of Montana. So we were close to where we wanted to be. We were close to the audience, but we weren't quite there yet. So part of what I think the challenge is for people such as yourself and for companies like FedEx is to make your assumptions, but then challenge your assumptions on a fairly regular basis and never assume that just because you've seen a trend that that trend's going to last forever or that you were absolutely right and you had nailed it at that point. So we've kind of gone from looking at this heartland to more of a project Main Street, which is extending the reach and not ignoring people that were very important to us on the east and west coast of the United States, not just focusing in the middle, but focusing everywhere. Again, we've talked about this so much, I, I think we could give you a pop quiz and without even thinking you could answer it, is the importance of not just measuring outputs, but measuring outcomes. It's, it, I look at it, it really as an evolution. You know, you, it's not that we were wrong when we were measuring outputs. We had to get to the point where we can measure outputs, and now what we're working on is how to measure outcomes. Um, once we get outcomes nailed, and I'm sure we will, then there'll be something else that we'll come up with. But we'll just keep evolving. And here's Elvis again. Whoops. Even Bowles.
what can I say? Um, we're not looking at hitting a specific target, but if our activities really hit what we need them to hit with our entire audience, what's the ripple effect? Are we accomplishing our goals? Are we not just getting, as they talked about, a lot of clips? I think my first agency job was doing that little clip notebook. That was really fun because it was easy. I just, you know, cut and paste and cut and paste. But we don't do that anymore. Again, as professionals, we keep evolving and we keep changing. And that's what makes the profession interesting. That's what makes it dynamic. And quite frankly, that's what keeps us all working and in our jobs that we all love, I'm sure. Um, Again, the Barcelona principles, measuring outcomes rather than outputs. That's a theme, I think, of this conference. I heard about it this morning. You'll probably hear about it more this afternoon. Take that one home with you. We've worked on it very hard at FedEx, and we're going to keep working on it. But we're going to be, as a client, we're going to be looking at you to help us. Um, we um, had a... Um, little hit to our reputation last winter during our peak season when we had a package not so gently handled by one of our couriers and we really were aggressive in reacting to it but all along the way at every step of what we did in responding we were measuring we were polling we were researching to make sure that what we were doing was the right thing and people were understanding that the company shouldn't be judged on the unfortunate behavior of one person and I'm getting a red light, so I'm going to go really fast. This is, a, um, this is a chart that we've developed because we know our reputation drivers. We know them like the back of our hands. But what we have to figure out is which of the specific reputation drivers are getting the outcome we want. We, we're not going to hit them all equally. We're not going to hit them all at the same audience equally. So we need to look at them on an inv individual basis and be very disciplined and careful about where we're going. Um, this is a, come on, I mean, the effect on business results can and should be measured where possible. They should be measured, period. I think uh, David said something earlier, which would lead me to say, if, you, you know, if you're taking a business action as a communicator and you can't measure the results, or maybe Andre said this, some brilliant man said it before me, don't do it or, or ask yourself, why are you doing it? So you really need to keep the two linked. And finally, it's just good basic common sense. Listen to what people say, to what they're telling you. Talk to people like they're people, you know, the whole thing of, you know, companies are human too. Really humanize the company. We, we have to humanize the companies that we work for. Uh, we want it to tell stories. We, need, we have the numbers and the stat stat stats and the background, but we need to take that and turn that into stories that resonate with people and that they believe and that they trust us. Um, engage people by building relationships. That's the same kind of thing. We're all people, we're all in this together. And then finally, to measure uh, what's being said and the impact of it. It's not just measure what you're saying, but measure what, it's, what the impact is and if it's changing those behaviors. And they're gonna bring a big stick out and beat me in just a minute. But thank you very much. I uh, appreciate being here again. Thanks. That was fast. <laughs> um, as we bring up our next speaker, um, actually, David, I'm going to put you on the spot, just playing off Cindy here. So what did Elvis or, and this room have in common? Musical teams? Mm, Andre? along those lines, exactly. Elvis played the guitar, Stratocaster is a guitar, and that was a lame joke. Let me introduce you to David, <laughs> sorry. Did you get a prize? Yes, I'll get you a prize, beer, after. <laughs> David Kellis, as I mentioned, is with Clorox. He's the director of public relations and social media, and they're a, a really good example company in sort of connecting the dots between social media, uh, traditional media, and particularly business performance. So David? Good afternoon or um, good morning. I'm not really sure which one it is because I flew in from San Francisco today. Um, so it's I, I know it's the afternoon here, but it's probably uh, the morning for me still. 
Um, as the slide says, I'm David Kellis, Director of uh, PR and Social Media for Clorox. Clorox is a company you may not be that familiar with in Europe. Um, we're a CPG company, so we, we make bleach and other cleaning products, but we also um, own a lot of other brands like Burt's Bees and Brita Water Filters and Glad Trash Bags and Kingsford Charcoal and a lot of other products that um, I probably have never purchased. Um, so we're here to talk about measuring business results of um, PR and social media, and we're going to connect the dots, as David said, and go from talking about um, uh, outcomes and business results to showing you how we did it for PR, um, how we measure the ROI of the PR that we do at Clorox for our different brands, and how we are measuring social ROI as well. So we'll just start with... Um, I, I found this cartoon, and I don't know if this has happened to you before, giving a presentation, and um, it's the deer in the headlights look when it comes to social media. So um, we're in a brave new world of PR and uh, marketing communications, and the vehicles are changing every day, and, and you know something new emerges, and, and we're trying to keep up with you know what's the latest and what's the best way to reach and engage consumers. And as we're doing that, the measurement of those vehicles, those new things like social media and Facebook, lag a little bit behind. So um, we were in that situation with PR probably five to 10 years ago, and we came through it. And we're gonna kinda start with the PR case and show you how we measure PR from an ROI standpoint, and then how we're going to apply those same principles to um, social media. So um, in the old days of PR, we call them the dark ages, um, you could almost call PR like a faith-based initiative or faith-based marketing, whereas we didn't really have business results, so it was kind of like, um, you know, we knew it worked and, and we just told people, you know, it, it builds brands and um, it's good for credibility, but we really didn't have anything in terms of um, you know, what it did for the business. And at Clorox, uh, PR is divided up between corporate communications and, and marketing PR. So I'm on the brand marketing side. So everything I do is linked to the business results of the brands that I represent. So um, about five or six years ago, a number of companies started measuring the ROI of PR, and the dark ages ended, and we, we, there was a headline in Ad Age in the United States, and it basically said, PR works. So P&G, I think, was the first company to measure it in the United States, and a lot of us followed suit. And finally, we had some numbers to say, the money you're investing in public relations, those clipbooks that we've been talking about, and everything else generate business results and are efficient. So um, how did we do that at Clorox? Just um, give you a little bit of a flavor for how we approach it. So there's something called a marketing mix model or a market mix model that you've heard about before. And that is basically um, a way of looking at all of the marketing and sales activity for a given brand on a week by week and market by market basis. So all the activity is tracked, and then this model, through something called a regression analysis, isolates the different vehicles of marketing communications. So you can, through you know, a lot of work in this model, look at, okay, what was the impact of PR? What was the impact of advertising? What was the impact of my coupons? And really go isolate vehicle by vehicle um, the effect of, of the campaigns that we do. So the input that we gave to, to this model was impressions for PR. So we had to choose something and we chose impressions and kind of the, the sacrifice or the compromise that we made is we didn't really qualify the impressions. So all impressions were treated equal from the standpoint of how we were able to measure this. And the, the market mix model is an advertising based model. And so we had to find something in PR that correlated with GRPs, which is how advertising is measured. So impressions were chosen, and we had to make the compromise that um, all impressions for this case, um, for this sake, are the same. So what we found is um, that a good CPM, a really strong CPM, was correlated really highly with ROI. So a good CPM equals efficient marketing. And we've measured our PR programs across seven different brands, or seven times across five different brands. And we've gotten an ROI every time of at least a dollar 
for every dollar you spend. So the worst PR program we've done at Clorox generated a dollar twelve for every dollar that was spent, all the way up to one that we did for our Brita water filters, which generated three and a half dollars essentially for every dollar spent. So pretty amazing, and um, what we're seeing is is that our PR vehicles are more efficient than some of our larger spend advertising. And if you look at these charts, and I'm going to just walk away from my microphone for a second. Maybe I can point. But um, So on the left, this is measurement of two different programs. But um, on the left, you see spikes in sales in a given year attributed to PR broken down throughout the course of the year. So we can literally isolate the tactic that we did in the market at that time and see how much volume that it generated. So in the case of September 2008, this was for our bleach business. Um, this was a public service announcement we did around um, something called MRSA, M-R-S-A, which is a um, bacteria, a flesh-eating bacteria, as the media likes to call it, that uh, bleach is a solve for in terms of helping to prevent the spread of it. So we were able to look at our tactics throughout the course of the year and see which ones worked best. We also had an audio news release, probably something all of us have done, that was happening around disaster relief during that period. So those two things led to the biggest spike in sales attributed to PR um, for that year. And then at the end of the year, the last spike, uh, May 2009, was uh, H1N1, or the swine flu. I think it was the first outbreak of the swine flu in the United States. And that alone and the media coverage associated with it contributed to sales volume. So on the other side is a, another program that we did um, for our uh, wipes brand, our disinfecting wipes, and just comparing the PR program to um, our print and TV. So you see PR is in red, and that program is the one with a $1.12 ROI. And then you look at our print, which um, if you measure in terms of efficiency, um, our efficiency of this program was a 0.18, which it doesn't mean anything to you, but if you look at the number for the print in the middle, 0.6, and then TV was 0.3. So our PR was two to, th two to three times more efficient than our advertising spending that year. So pretty remarkable. Um, so we were able to, to use this model to measure PR year after year. And um, so now it's established at Clorox and, and at most CPG companies in the United States, PR is a pretty efficient vehicle. You know, up to a certain level of spend, maybe it's two or three million dollars. And what a lot of the models will tell you or, or predict is if you start to spend more than three or four million on a given brand in PR, the efficiency is going to go down. And it's going to start to get closer to some of your paid vehicles like advertising. So how do we adopt this um, to social media? So the time has come to do this because we're all talking about social media. It's an important part of the earned universe. And um, the way we are going to approach it is there, there's a different output in this case where we used impressions for PR and it's going to be engagement. And um, engagement is, is similar to where we were with PR. Like we know it's worth something. Somebody engages with our brand if they take an action in social media, but we're just not sure how much it's worth. But the hypothesis is um, the higher the engagement, the more efficient your marketing will be and the better the ROI will be. So um, engagement for us is just KPIs, and, and every KPI it, you know, for a given campaign is going to be different, but it's things like Facebook fans and reach and impressions, which can, be, which can be measured on Facebook based on actions that people take. It's video views or shares. It's website visits. And it's also good old PR impressions, too, because that's something that you can get not only from Facebook, but just from the rest of your earned media program. So and it even comes down to positive tone. So these are things that you can set up at the beginning of your social media program as our KPIs. And then as I go on to the next page, the KPIs will kind of be put into the model the way, um, the, way the impressions were. So for measuring social at Clorox, and we're, I, I wish this conference were happening um, in a couple of months because I don't have the number yet for our first social campaign that we're measuring. But we're, we're going through the process right now, and I hope to have it um, in August, and then maybe for the next PR measurement seminar in, in my hometown, San Francisco, there I can talk about that. So the difference in how we're approaching this, and this is kind of important in terms of how we define social, is we're not going to, within this 
uh, marketing campaign, and this is um, for our Clorox toilet products that we're measuring. I know it's very glamorous, but toilet products are important to us at, at Clorox. So um, what we're measuring is the entire campaign and not necessarily different aspects of the campaign. So we're not measuring the PR impressions, or we're not measuring the Facebook likes specifically for ROI, and we're not measuring the paid media, in this case, which would be Facebook advertising mostly, but then also some, <laughs> some other digital banner ads. We're lumping it all together, and we're basically saying to support this campaign, which you know arguably is called Ode to the Commode, um, let's just call it that for today. So, all the, the aspects of the campaign that come together, we're looking at the total cost of that and then the impressions and KPIs that we've generated. And based on an entire campaign, we're going to get an ROI for social media at Clorox. So it, it's kind of similar to how we had to make a compromise when we first measured PR that all impressions were equal, even though we know as PR people that that isn't true. The compromise here is we're going to get an ROI on social, but it's not just going to be earned ROI, it's going to be all of social. And we have to realize that social media does go beyond you know, what we do in PR. There's, there's a paid aspect, there's an owned aspect to social. So this is measuring an entire social campaign. It's using the market mix model, but um, it's basically not breaking down the vehicle. So we'll get one number and hopefully we'll be able to say, as a result of doing this campaign for Clorox toilet products, we spent, and, and in this case, I, my number in front of me, I think it's about three and a half million dollars. We spent three and a half million dollars over six month period, and this is how much revenue it generated for the company based on doing this campaign. So um, that's how we're approaching it at Clorox, and I know um, I, I wanted to look into if I'm doing a presentation on social media measurement, how some other companies are doing it. So um, similar to the way it was for measuring publicity or PR, P&G has already done it. I haven't seen the numbers in terms of what they've done, but this is just a quote from their CMO talking about how they consider social media just another component of the marketing mix and they put it into the model and they've been able to get an ROI for it. So we know it's happening. It, it's probably not the same way that we're approaching it um, from a paid owned earn standpoint with social Clorox, but it's the way that they measure PR. And then Nutella in Germany, a couple of things here. Um, so they've measured their Facebook advertising and they've seen a positive ROI for Facebook advertising. And then they've measured the combination of their TV and their Facebook campaign together and noticed that that performed better than each would on, on its own. So basically the effect of um, having a campaign that's on television that drives to Facebook and Facebook advertising. And then the final example, uh, example, Diageo, and I think this is Captain Morgan, which is one of my favorite brands, um, along with Jameson. And um, so they measured a couple of things here, but um, their Facebook advertising alone achieved an ROI of $5 for every dollar they spent. And that's when you see that big graphic of five. But they also measured across uh, several brands uh, their overall Facebook campaign. And what they saw is a really strong lift. I think it was a 20% lift in sales over the two or three brands, Captain Morgan's and Smirnoff was one of them, where they did a Facebook campaign um, they saw a 20% increase in sales over those brands compared to brands that weren't doing Facebook campaigns. So three examples of, of companies that are out there in the marketplace and getting a read on social. So um, the question is, what's next? And um, I would like, you know, for the next set of principles, and I don't know if they're going to be principles coming out of, of Dublin or not, but that social can and must be measured by business results. So we know we've been able to do it for PR. I think you know it's, it's fairly safe to assume that we're going to be able to do it for social, and we're not going to be doing social for social's sake. And we're going to be able to answer that nagging question, what is a Facebook fan worth? Why should I do a brand page? You know, What is engagement? If I get a consumer to like something I'm doing or post a comment, what does that mean? So those are the KPIs. And if we can show that the KPIs are leading to business results, then people are going to continue to invest in social media. But you know, it, it's not even just social media. That's kind of the immediate frontier. But there's social bookmarking, which is our friends at Pinterest. And I don't know if that's a, 
a global phenomenon. But Pinterest is a site where ba basically people bookmark things and put images that they find online on their page like they would literally bookmark things at home. And then there's something else coming up called social discovery, which is the next evolution of social media. And that is about basically, um, it's, it's a way to connect with people who you don't know. So Facebook is, is for connecting with people who you know or you kind of know, and social discovery is a way of connecting, people, connecting with people you don't know, kind of like a match.com type thing, but not for dating, but just for meeting people with similar interests. So every day there's new vehicles evolving, but I think we can start by saying uh, we feel confident that we can measure social media and any other social dot, dot, dot that comes up along the way. Great. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, David, I think you make a great point in terms of that uh, social canon must be measured by business results. I think actually in tomorrow's uh, excuse me, Friday mornings, I think it is, session about social media. There will be a presentation, I believe, about how to sort of evolve that principle. And I also, you know, I made a sort of joke when I was talking about, sh you know, a goal saying shape the bleach dialogue online. Now that I know that Clorox will kill flesh-eating bacteria, I, I'm never joking around ever again. I, and I'm glad to know that. I saw a few questions as we were going along. Um, would you like, I saw your hand come up, Antonia, and then we'll go to you. Okay. Yes, so be the one behind on Tony. Hello. Um, I'm in consumer PR. Hello. Um, and I saw that you were saying you can measure ROI, and I got the impression you were in consumer PR, but the co coverage that you g generate in your activity, is it mainly news that you, that, that you focus on? So when you send a release out, you're hoping to get instant results? Because for me, I focus on um, features, and so it's hard to try and track the difference between, what, like you don't know really when a feature's coming out. So I was wondering what, what kind of um, results do you get in your media coverage? So I think, is this, is this working? <laughs> so um, the way we approach it is kind of backward looking. So we do focus on at least the campaigns that we measured that I shared were based on publicity. So trying to get media coverage, newspapers, television, features in magazines, um, and then also coverage with bloggers. But um, so the, it's a backward looking approach where after the year is over, we track all the media coverage on a week by week, market okay. by market basis. And then that goes into a model to look at sales in those markets on a week by week basis and what things can't be attributed to other activity going on in the market, whether it's discounting or an advertising campaign. So it is based on the publicity and the articles that we get in the media. Um, similar to what you're talking about. Okay, well, that's helpful, thank you. Antonia? Hi, I'm Antonia from UNICEF. Andre, I had a question, if you could elaborate. You had made a point in one of your slides where you said that you found there was an indirect association between your PR or NPS and, uh, and sales. Is that, is that correct? You said between 2005 and 2009 you were doing some research and I, I didn't understand the conclusion that you, that you reached. That was one question. Okay. And then I have another question as well, which um, it's for Andre, Cindy, whoever, in terms of working in multiple markets, internationally, uh, you said you're working in 100 countries, measuring in 42 of them. Um, was it difficult to establish, what were some of the difficulties in establishing one common KPI across all those markets, especially when you're selling different products predominantly in one market versus another? And we're also, you know, it's hard, uh, news aggregators are, sort of, you know, bending more towards Western media, if that mm -hmm. was a problem. Mm -hmm. I'll start with the, with the f last uh, question. And probably you can share some, I think you do it for multiple countries as well. Um, our KPIs are relevant of, uh, we, when we establish our KPIs, we establish the KPIs with, uh, they should be applicable for all markets. And they are now applied to all markets. So where you saw my K five KPIs, either if, if you're in China or in Mexico, the US or Canada or whatever, they use the same KPIs. My sectors also use the same KPIs. They have uh, sometimes specific campaigns on product introductions. Uh, for instance, if we introduce a new uh, electric shaver, 
which is of course different than introducing uh, a new CT scanner range uh, for my healthcare sector or a reputational kind of thing. Uh, but we use the overall KPIs on a consistent base for every market. Even stronger, the bonuses or the flexible part of the salary is related to those KPIs across the markets. Um, was that easy? No, it was unbelievably difficult. Um, and I think I hinted a little bit at that. We, we made a little bit of a mistake there that we did not include when we rolled it out or when, when we introduced it to the organization. We introduced it only to the communications part of the organization and not to the business part of the organization because we could have learned uh, from the business uh, what their specific requirements would be. Um, there's, there's a couple of tone of voice, for instance, in the KPIs is a, is a challenging one. Tone of voice is different in China than in the US. Uh, so you have to use an agency, a support agency, because we, we outsourced everything, and eh? the whole measurement we outsourced. Um, you have to use an agency that not only relies on software, but on, on, on real people who can make the translation also to a cultural uh, translation of uh, specific media coverage. Um, do, you, do you manage that globally, or does each market contract outsource to its no, own agency? we manage it globally. Yeah, and actually, the company that does its representatives room report internationals. Uh, Thomas helped and create yeah. the system. Ben over here runs it off and on, and so yeah, yeah that's. Yeah. So we, we manage it globally. Uh, my people in the markets do not have to do anything. The only thing they come up with every now and then is, hey, uh, you don't measure the right kind of media because they get some internal pressure from their business uh, um, business people. Why is this medium not included? Because there was such a great article. Or why is this blogger not included? And I think twice or three times a year, we evaluate the list. Is it still relevant? And we make the adjustments. So that was the, la the, first, the last question. The first question was about? About the, you, you made a point about, uh, you found over from 2005 to 2009 an indirect association. No, I, no, I mentioned that um, I still have to, because we measure the overall reputation of the company. Uh, and I think the overall reputation of the company uh, is not, it's difficult to rela relate that back to sales. Uh, I. I have still not found the, 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 the key to uh, link uh, an increase in re or an improvement in reputation to an improvement or an increase in sales on a company level. I think the example that I heard from, from Clorox is probably an example you can use, and that's what I try to explain. We did a, I did three or four trials when I worked in the US, where, for instance, a new TV range was introduced in four specific markets uh, with a campaign, and then I related uh, the communications efforts to the actual sales increase of that specific TV range. And I think that's also what you did with Clorox. I think that can be done. But on the overall group company level, I cannot do that. Because there's so many other things uh, that are relevant for our reputation or our NPS. Uh, just to give you an example, in the last 14 months we had three profit warnings, which is of course not good, but that, ha that, 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 that hurts your reputation, that hurts your MPS. And we had a discussion this morning reviewing back on the, on the first quarter of this year, um, uh, where our NPS score went down and for the overall company, and why did it go down, where all the three sectors went up, is because for the first time in three or four years, uh, due to some financial uh, calculations, we had to uh, report an official loss, which is of course translated in media negatively. All the other messages were there, all the other messages were picked up, but the main message was that Philips reports a loss. And then your whole NPS goes down, and I don't want to... Uh, so there are all kinds of things that you cannot influence that at the end will you influence your NPS score. Cindy, I, I saw you wanted to make a comment, and then we'll go to you, and then we'll close since we're right at time. Okay. Well, this is the 
Second question, not the first one. Uh, we want to be where Andre is. I mean, basically, FedEx is in over 200 different countries, but we're in a very different place outside the United States. Um, in the United States, brand awareness is, we've got that in spades. I mean, we people know who we are. They're very familiar with who we are. Outside the United States, we're really more of a, a brand building phase. So it's it's looked at regionally. We've um, our, we have, uh, we're divided into Latin America, Asia, and Europe, and Canada, and then the United States. And we look at it, uh, the regions outside the U.S. really work together because, again, they're, they're more in that awareness phase. Um, eventually, we want to pull, pull it more together, but we really have to be realistic about where we are in the different parts of the world. So right now, it's, uh, it's, we're not where you are. One day. All right. I know we're right at time. Barry, can we go for one minute longer? This gentleman's been waiting on a question for quite some time. Just a short question. Florian Laszlo, Media Monitoring from Austria. Um, it's about the, the Clorox presentation. And don't you limit the importance of communications way too much when you just link it to short-term product sales? Because as we now saw in the picture of Philips, that there are more things to communications than just product sales and more things than you can't really influence. So when you limit to that, isn't it quite short-sighted or on a, on a very limited basis? And secondly, uh, I saw that you put together PR, earned media, and uh, Facebook ads that you bought. So there are different categories, and we're always very careful at the differentiating between PR and ad business, and you put it all together and make it an ROI. Isn't it uh, that also a little bit oversimplifying in a way that also AVEs and counting circulations are what we always say we don't want to do? I think the answer to your first question is is yes, it's it's oversimplifying and it's very short term focused. But um, we wanted to start somewhere in terms of measuring the impact of, of the PR that we do and to justify the spending that we want to get. And we you know we want to build PR programs for our brand. And when we go to the businesses with an idea and say we want to spend a million or two million on PR, unless we have some way of measuring the short term impact of it we're not going to be able to justify that spend. And that's unfortunately how our advertising is, is measured. So in order to compete for those marketing dollars, um, we had to come up with a way to measure PR in the short term. But I agree, um, the next level would be long-term impact of public relations on a company or on a, you know corporate reputation and its um, correlation with sales or the long-term effect of what we do in PR. But I think that's, that's a goalpost that's a little bit further down the road for all of us. And we needed something in the interim to be able to compete with some of the other marketing vehicles. To your second question about social, um, although we like to think we live in a separate universe and we're about earned media and, and paid media is different and maybe they're not as credible and, and, and that could be true, we also have to understand like the investment we make in social as companies the consumer doesn't really make a difference between paid, owned, and earned. And if we are going to invest as, you know, and I come from the marketing side of the company, so if I'm going to make a marketing spend on Facebook, and that means having a Facebook page, and that's a PR tool, but then in order to get fans to my Facebook page, I'm going to have to do Facebook advertising, and that's a paid media advertising tool. So I think you have to look at it holistically and put them together to say, this new thing called social media, is it worth investing in in general? And then I think if we can determine that it is, then we can break it down similar to the way we've done in the past and look at just the earned side and just the paid side. But in the beginning, and a lot of what we do at Clorox is so integrated, um, and the principles of integrated marketing, which probably came before the principles of, of measuring PR, probably. And, and in integrated marketing, it's all about campaigns. So we wanted to measure the effect of this campaign in totality um, without having to isolate out PR. But I, I do think once social gets accepted and once we can show in general that it's generating business results, then we can break it out. You know, in a way, what I really like about having you guys on this panel is, David, in a way, what you were talking about to his question and showing is how do you measure the incremental effect of incremental 
uh, resource devotion to PR and incremental sales. And then there's this whole other thing called the total brand equity, sales that would have happened no matter what, which is basically measured with the stuff that Cindy and Andre were showing. Um, so let's have a big round of applause for the panel.